Bibles, please, to Deuteronomy chapter 4. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy chapter 4. I know Pastor Matt was kidding when he said that my, uh, my brother wished that I was, or was glad that I was leaving. But uh, if, if he was glad that I was leaving, I think I could think of plenty of reasons why he would be. <laughs> right? Uh, I, had some, I had some things I had planned to tell him before we left, and I didn't get a chance to. And so what better place to do it in front of a group of people, you know, with Facebook and things like that, you know. And uh, you're trying hard enough not to get choked up, you know, and then you see your brother walk in who's been your hero your whole life, you know. And I thought about it, and I thought back, uh, uh, getting cold here. Um, thought back about uh, when I was in first grade, I remember the time in first grade, and uh, I had this, got for Christmas, I got this little uh, keyboard. I took it to school for show and tell. I didn't know how to play it at all. <laughs> I just thought it was the coolest thing. I, I, and I told my teacher, I, she said, well, can you play anything? I said, no, I can't play anything. And this was like right after Christmas break, we bring it back in, I'm trying to show it off for show and tell. And uh, I said, but I bet if you get my brother, he could come play it. Because ever since I was little, I just knew he could do anything. I just knew he could do anything. I still know it today. So I got him in a lot of trouble growing up. <laughs> because I knew, I knew he could do anything. And so I would run my mouth. Um, I would run my mouth. Non stop, and it is a miracle. It is a miracle of God that I am still here today, but it's also a miracle of Him for protecting me when I would run my mouth because I knew when He was around that nobody would dare lay a finger on me because He would fight my battles for me. And so I am grateful. I'm grateful for having Him here today, and thanks for being here, Chip. Thank you. Love you. Deuteronomy chapter 4. A little while ago, I finished reading my Bible schedule for the year, and I, uh, I, w I wanted to start off and uh, I did the, the pastor's challenge in January, read the New Testament in, in a month. Praise God, that was wonderful. To finish that right before, right before going to Sardinia, so I know that helped. You read, read your entire New Testament in a month and then go see a, a foreign mission field the following day. So praise God, that was wonderful. And I, uh, I got there, and uh, so I finished reading that, and I said, what am I going to read next? And so I went, and I said, you know, I'm going to read. I want to just study some things out that I'm not as familiar with. And so I went to uh, start with the life of Saul, and I wanted to read the, the, the kings in the Old Testament. And so I, I read that in chronological order. I read all the kings in chronological order from, you know, from all the way through the history of Israel. So I wanted to see how they all lined up, how the prophets fit in, you know, when, when was certain prophet living and which king were they prophesying about. So I read that and I finished that up. And I, and I can't tell you what day this year it was when I finished reading that, but I decided, you know what I'm going to do? I'm just going to go back to Genesis now because I'd finished my reading schedule. I'm just going to go back to Genesis chapter 1, verse number 1. And uh, I didn't uh, have a schedule exactly. Some days I read more, some days I le read less, you know. Um, but I, I tell you all of that to tell you that I didn't intentionally come to these verses and these chapters during this period of time. I finished uh, uh, the book of Leviticus, and I finished the, the book of Numbers, and then I get to Deuteronomy, and I'm thinking, I'm thinking, God, I'm getting ready to go face some giants here, you know. And I, I'm, I'm reading Leviticus and Numbers. And I'm like, God, I need something better than Leviticus and Numbers and Deuteronomy here. I, I need David. You know what I mean? I'm like, God, I, I'm, I'm reading. I, was, I need some more encouragement than what I can find in these. I, almost, I decided, you know, I'm going to change what I'm reading here. That way I can get some more encouraging verses. I wanted to read David and Goliath. I wanted to read, is there not a cause? I wanted to read, you know, uh, I'll feed your bones to the fowls of the air. I wanted to read those kind of things, you know. And so I came and I turned the page, and here we are in Deuteronomy chapter 1 and verses uh, 1 through 4 of chapter 4. And I read the first four, ver first four chapters of the book of Deuteronomy. And God had for me what I needed in those verses. <clears throat> and if you will just be faithful in reading your Bible, Amen. if you will just wake up in the morning or before you go to bed at night or both or during the day, if you'll read your Bible every day, then the Lord knows what you need that day. And He will ordain it so that what you need is going to be right in front of you because I would not have picked... Deuteronomy ch chapters 1 through 4 to find the encouragement I needed, but I found it here. And if you'll read your Bible, then the Lord will use those same words and He'll encourage you with what you need. It may not be what I need that day, but it'll be exactly what you needed. If you'll just be faithful and you'll stay in God's Word. I found what I needed in these verses. Deuteronomy chapter 4, verses 1 through 4. I ask if we'll stand together to read those verses. Deuteronomy chapter 4, verses 1 through 4. The Bible says this, Now therefore hearken, O Israel, 
unto the statutes and unto the judgments which I teach you, for to do them that ye may live, and go in and possess the land which the Lord God of your fathers giveth you. You shall not add unto the word which I command you, neither shall ye diminish aught from it, that ye may keep the commandments of the Lord your God which I command you. Your eyes have seen what the Lord did because of Baal Peor. For all the men that followed Baal Peor, the Lord thy God hath destroyed them from among you. But ye that did cleave unto the Lord your God are alive, every one of you, this day. Let's pray together. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, I don't have the strength to do what I need to do today, Lord. But that's been true every day of my life. I've woken up, Lord, and I've needed your strength, Lord, and you have got me here today, Lord, by your grace. And, Lord, I know that through this sermon, Lord, I need your grace again. Lord, I can't work in hearts. Only you can work in hearts. Only your spirit can do the work that needs to be done here today, Lord. And I pray, Lord, as you have encouraged me and given me strength to face the giants ahead of me, Lord, and as you have challenged our family and encouraged us, Lord, and as your miracles have brought us to this point, Lord, I pray that you'll encourage your people today with this same text. Lord, I love you and I trust you. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you. you may be seated. <clears throat> The book of Deuteronomy, when you open up the book of Deuteronomy, what you're reading is you're reading the end of the life of Moses. The children of Israel have wandered through the desert for 40 years, and then they have gone and they have faced their enemy, but they were too afraid to go and claim what the Lord had promised them. And so they went and they wandered another 40 years in the wilderness. And then they go, and this is right now, the last 40-year span is coming to an end. And Moses remembers well the last time they were getting ready to enter into the land and how they didn't have the courage to do it. Moses remembers well how he told them, go and claim the land the Lord has promised you. And they didn't have the courage, they turned back. And as a result of that partially, and because of his own sin, Moses now is not going to be able to enter into the promised land himself. And so he looks at it now and he says, hey, listen, guys, don't go back and make the same mistake that you did that cost your fathers their chance to go enter into the promised land. Don't go back and make the same mistake that you did and that I did that cost me my chance to go to the promised land. In chapter 3 of, these, of, of this, uh, this text here, you see that Moses beseeches the Lord again, Lord, please just let me go into the promised land. And the Lord's answer is, hey, listen, just satisfy yourself and don't talk to me anymore about this. He says, you know what, just leave it alone. You're not going. You're not going to enter into the promised land. Joshua is going to lead people into the promised land. And so Moses remembers this well, and he has some advice for the children of Israel. He knows now that he does not get to go into the promised land. He knows that this generation is going to face the same enemy that scared away their fathers. And he knows that they need something to go into this new land. And here is what he tells them. He tells them to remember. He tells them, in chapter 1, to remember, he reminds them of the victories the Lord has won for them before their very eyes. Turn to chapter 1, and we're going to go through some of the reminders by way of introduction. We'll go through some of the reminders that Moses gives them. Chapter 1, in verse number 19, he reminds them how the Lord had brought them through the great and terrible wilderness to get to that point. In verse number 19, it says, And we departed from Horeb. We went through all that great and terrible wilderness which she saw by the way of the mountain of the Amorites, as the Lord our God commanded us, and we came to Kadesh Barnea. He reminds them that you went through a great and a terrible wilderness to get here. Yeah. And what he tells them is, remember that God brought you through that great and terrible wilderness. Amen. It was filled with left turns and right turns. There was enemies on every corner. There were times where you were going to go and take a straight shot, but I stopped you because there was war in front of you and you weren't ready for it. He reminds them that the, the desert could have eaten you up, that, you, that it required miracles to get you through. You needed meat, you needed manna, you needed water, you needed all those things. Remember, I provided for you for all of those things from that point to this point now. And here today, it's true of every single one of us that God has gotten us from that point to this point now. Remember, remember what the Lord has brought you through. If there is ever a time that has been hard for you, if there's ever been a time that has been trouble for you, or you thought, how can I even make it? You think back on how you felt at that time, and you can only think about it now because the Lord brought you through it. Amen. It may be hard to think about, but you should remember that those hard times, the Lord brought you through those hard times. Remember what the Lord has brought you through to get to this point. Amen. It was a crooked path that brought Israel to the promised land after all those years, but God had designed that route for their perfecting and for their proving. You know, it was a crooked path that brought our family to Sardinia. We started 10 years ago in 2009. We surrendered our hearts to go serve the Lord in Italy. And we had a certain plan on how we were going to do it. We had a college we were going to go to. We had a church we were going to attend. We had a missions board we were going to go with. And we had a missionary we were going to go work with. And that was our plan on how to get there. And we said, here we go, God. We've got this plan. Little did I know, my, my plan was built on a 20-inch uh, 
20-inch gas line with 400 PSI gas on it. It just was doomed to fail. And so I go and I, I present my plan before the Lord, and I said, I said, Lord, here is how we're going to do this. But you know what? My plan wasn't God's plan. Amen. God had a different route for us to go. And I, if I was in control, would not have picked any of those directions. But you know, that plan brought us here today. Amen. And it filled, us with all, it filled our lives with all of those miracles between now and then. It helped to equip us for some of the wars we're going to fight when we get there. Amen. We could have gone 10 years ago had the Lord allowed it, but he didn't allow it. He set us on the path, and he directed the route. I look back on it now, and I see that God had ordained that journey. And so remember back on everything that God has brought you through from that point in your life to now and understand that he can get you the rest of the way. "'Twas grace that brought me safe thus far, tis grace will bring me home." Amen? Amen. Remember. Remember the victories the Lord has won before your very eyes. He reminds them of the losses that they have suffered due to their unbelief. In verse number 21, it says, Behold, the Lord thy God has set the land before thee. Go up and possess it, as the Lord God of thy fathers has said unto thee. Fear not, neither be dismayed, neither be discouraged. He tells them, here it is. Here is the promise. Here is, here is the land before you. You can go in, you can conquer. But did they go? They didn't go. They turned around for fear. And he says, remember that day. Remember that day. Remember how none of your fathers now were allowed to enter into that promised land. And now this generation is going to have to face the enemies that conquered their fathers. This generation is going to have to go face those walls that shadows darken the faith of their fathers that did not allow them to enter in. He says, remember the time that you went and you fought those enemies by yourself and you were turned back beaten. Remember that you cannot defeat this enemy by yourself, but only with the Lord. Their first mistake when they went to go, read number verse number 21. That was the verse I just read. Read, read verse um, <clears throat> 26. Notwithstanding, ye would not go up, but rebelled against the commandment of the Lord your God. And ye murmured in your tents and said, Because the Lord God hated us, he hath brought us forth out of the land of Egypt to deliver us into the hand of the Amorites, to destroy us. You know, their first mistake, the mistake of their fathers, was not when they turned back from the battle. Their first mistake was not when they were afraid to fight. Their first mistake was when they said, You know what, we're here because God hates us. That was their first mistake. Their first mistake was they looked back and they said, you know what brought us here? The hatred of God. Did God deliver them from Egypt out of bondage to bring them there to kill them? He did not. Amen. And God did not deliver you from everything in your life to bring you here to destroy you. God brought you here because he loves you. Amen. That is why you are where you are today, because of the patience of God, because of the long suffering of God. And it's the goodness of God that bringeth you to repentance. Yep. He brought you here because he loves you and because he has good plans for you. If you'll fight those enemies by faith, then you'll defeat them. They said, because the Lord hates us, because he hated us, he brought us forth. Remember that the Lord loves you. Remember the valleys that the Lord has brought you through. Remember the losses you have suffered when you forgot who you are in the Lord, his beloved people. Moses reminds them in verse number 28, he reminds them that not every influence is a good influence, even if it comes from the brethren. Verse number 28, they said this. They said, Whither shall we go up? Our brethren have discouraged our hearts. Our brethren have discouraged our hearts. Remember this. Remember to surround yourself with people who believe in the power of God. Amen. Remember to surround yourself with people who believe in the power of God. And if you surround yourself with cowards, remember this, that you will soon be counted as one of them. You will soon become a coward yourself if you surround yourself with cowards. Verse 28 continues to say, The people is greater and taller than we. The cities are great and walled up to heaven. And moreover, we have seen the sons of the Anakims there. Those were giants. So you know what? They said this. They said, there are people there who will oppose me, you say. Well, that's true. There are. There are people there that will oppose you. There are obstacles in the way that I can't overcome. True again. Those great cities are walled up to heaven. You say, I'm too weak to conquer this enemy. You know what? You're right. You are. You are too weak. There are giants in the way, and giants build big walls. But giants can be slain. Amen. And all walls that are built up to heaven, they're not a problem for God that lives in heaven because he's looking down at them. So let them build their walls all the way to heaven, but the God of heaven looks down and is not concerned about those walls. Amen. If they build those walls to heaven, they're just closer to God for him to knock them down. Moses at that time tried to press them towards the victory they'd been promised to win, but they didn't go. And he reminds them of that. He reminds them of this. He reminds them in chapter 2, he reminds them that giants are giants, but they're not immortal. They can die. 
and that the Lord has conquered them before. Turn to chapter 2. Moses in verse chapter 4, verses 1 through 4, is telling them to remember all these things. He tells them in chapter 2, verses 19 through 21, he says, When thou comest nigh over against the children of Ammon, distress them not, nor meddle with them, for I will get, not give thee the land of the children of Ammon any possession, because I have given it to the children of Lot for a possession. So he's saying, listen, this land here, I have promised this uh, land to the children of Lot. And then it goes on and says that also, that also was accounted a land of giants. So why are the children of there the children of Lot there now? Because the giants are gone. Why are not the giants there anymore? Because God has driven them out. God has conquered the giants and given that land to the children of Lot. And you read on and you read about the children of Esau. The children of Esau in the next land. God says, hey, listen, don't go up that way. I have given that land to the children of Esau. Well, the children of Esau had their own enemies to drive out. And so listen to this. If God, if God will drive out giants before the children of Lot, what will he do for the children of Abraham? What will he do for the children of Abraham, the children of the promise? If God will drive out the enemies of Esau, what will God do for Jacob? Amen. What will God do for Jacob, who was called Israel, Jacob, who is the land of the promise? If God will drive out the enemies of Lot, if God will drive out the enemies of Esau, if God will slay giants before David, what will he do for the cause of Christ? Amen. And as we go and as we face giants, and as we go and we face things that are bigger than us and walled cities that we wonder, how am I ever going to penetrate that obstacle? We remember, hey, you know what? God has conquered these giants before. God has knocked down these walls before, and if he'll do it for Esau, he'll do it for Christ. Amen. He'll do it in the name of his holy son. Amen. By the time we get to chapter 3, we see that they've been sent back into the desert for further training. And then at the end of the chapter, we see at this point, they've actually taken down some of those high walls. And at this point, the people of Israel have actually even conquered some of those dreaded giants. In verses 5 to 6, it tells us all these cities were fenced with high walls, gates, and bars, and we utterly destroyed them. Look at that. They are knocking down some of those high walls, some of those bars, some of those gates. They're able to destroy them. Verse number 13 says the land they are in now, they conquered the land, that land which was called the land of the giants. And you know what? If you aren't facing giants, then this may not mean anything to you, but it does to me. If you are in a point in your life where you are not facing giants, or you're not coming up to an obstacle that is too big for you, and you're wondering, Lord, how on earth am I going to do that? And this may not mean anything to you, but it does to me. I needed to see a giant get conquered. Amen. I was like, Lord, maybe I'll just change to where I know it is in the Bible. I'll go look for David and Goliath. I'll go look for a giant being slain. I needed to see a giant get conquered, and God showed me where he conquered entire countries filled with giants. Amen. He conquered entire countries filled with giants. He did it for the cause of Lot. He did it for the cause of Abraham. Esau, he did it for the cause of David. He will do it for the cause of Christ. The Lord had given them victory after victory along the way. Not because they were strong, but because he's strong. Not because they are holy, but because he is holy. Not because they were always faithful to keep his covenant, but because he is always faithful to keep his. That's the first three chapters of the book of Deuteronomy. Amen. That brings us back to chapter 4, where we started. You might read the Bible and think, why is this written here again? You know, if you read Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, then by the time you get to Exodus to Deuteronomy, you have read the same story multiple times again. And you say, God, why did you record this same story? I've read this already. You know why it's in there again? Because the people of Israel needed to hear it again. Amen. That's why. God gave Moses a message and said, go tell the people of Israel this to be of good courage. Go tell the Israel to remember all these things that we did right now because they needed to hear it again. And God knew that 2,000, 3,000 years later, there would be a guy who'd be heading on a plane the next day who needed to hear that God could conquer giants. Amen. And so he recorded it again for you, for me, and for them because, you know, we need to be reminded sometimes. We need to be reminded, in verse number 1 of chapter 4 says, Now therefore hearken. I love the word therefore. Amen. I think it's my favorite word in the whole Bible. When I read the word therefore, it tells me to pause. It tells me, hey, you know what, in case you missed it, what I said before this was pretty important. It says therefore, therefore means like because. It means because of this. Or in other words, so because of everything that I just said, because of everything I just told you, therefore, for that reason, I'm getting ready to tell you now. It gives you a direct application of what was just said. And it tells you, hey, listen, pay attention. Pay attention because what's coming next is the application of everything I just told you. And in verse number four, it says this, Now therefore hearken, O Israel, unto the statutes and unto the judgments which I teach you for to do them, that ye may live and go in and possess the land which the Lord God of your fathers giveth you. It starts off and it says, So therefore. So therefore, because of those great battles won by the Lord and those great losses brought about by fear, because you're going to face those giants again, remember, he says, 
Because those walls reach heaven, whose shadows darkened the faith of your fathers. Remember. That enemy made you feel like a grasshopper last time and cost an entire generation their lives in front of you. And now that same enemy is facing this generation. He says, remember, or will another generation have to be lost in the shadow of those walls? Will we wait until another generation dies at the feet of that same enemy before we will claim the promises of God and go and take the land that he's given us? Now therefore hearken, O Israel, he says. That word hearken means listen. Amen. It means hear it. You know, in order to hear something, you have to be present when it's spoken. And so if you want to hear the statutes of the Lord and the judgments of the Lord, you have to be there when they are spoken. Amen. And where are the statutes and, and, uh, and commandments of the Lord spoken? Well, they're not spoken in front of a television on a Sunday. They're not spoken. They are not commanded. They are not taught in a fishing boat on a Sunday morning. They are not taught in a hunting stand. That is not where you hear the statutes and the commandments of the Lord. If you want to hear them, you need to be present. You need to be parked in that church pew. You need to be sitting in front of the man of God, reading the word of God, so that you can do the will of God. Amen. It says, hearken, he says. Remember, to, remember because of those things, because you can be defeated, or you can win, but it depends on whether or not you listen. He says, hearken, listen. He says, remember to listen to what I teach you. You hear the statutes, but also learn them. Whether you're old or young, allow yourself to be taught. Amen. Be teachable. Come here and come here to hear, but don't let it go in one ear and out the other. Be teachable. Amen. If you go and you hear those things and you just put them in one ear out the other, then you're not going to ever grow from them. Let these things find a home in your heart and let them give you courage for the battle. Verse 1, he tells them to listen to them. He tells them to learn them, but he tells them to do those things for to do them, for the reason of doing them. If you don't do the first two, if you're not present when the Lord is speaking the word, when the pastor is speaking the word of God, and if you are not learning what it says, if you are not allowing it to teach you and instruct you, you are never going to be able to do what it's commanded you to do. It says, do these things for to do it. We need to put ourselves in position to do these things by putting ourselves in position to hear them and learn them. Listen to them with the intent of doing them. Come in here with a plan to learn. Come and learn with a plan to apply them to your life. I wonder how often do we sit under the teaching of God's statutes and judgments, but we sit here with no intention of learning or doing anything. We sit here under the teaching of God's word, and we have no idea or no plan to ever change anything in our life because of it. Hey, the secret is everything the pastor says is not for somebody else. A lot of it is for you. A lot of it is for me. We need to come here with the idea of applying those things to our life, allowing ourselves to be taught by those things. Verse number 2 says this, You shall not add unto the word which I command you, neither shall you diminish aught from it. He's saying, listen, because of all those things I just told you, don't add or take away from any of the commandments of God. Hey, listen, when God says something, don't change it. Amen. When God says something, don't change it. Don't add to it. Don't take away from it. Revelation 22, 18 through 19 says, For I testify unto every man that heareth the words of the prophecy of this book, if any man shall add unto these things, God shall add unto him the plagues that are written in this book. And if any man shall take away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God shall take away his part out of the book of life and out of the holy city and from the things which are written in this book. Don't take anything away from what the word of God says. Amen. If you take away from something that God said, you have changed his words. You have changed his words. To take away from something that God said is to ignore parts of it. Right. If you take it away, you're ignoring it. Here, watch this. Uh, when my wife used to teach a Sunday school class here. She would teach the girls, and she would always often bring in cookies or cupcakes or something like that. She was always cooking, and I would wake up in the morning, and the house would be filled with the smell of cupcakes or cookies or something like that. And she would know that before I got to the kitchen, she had to tell me, hey, don't eat those cupcakes. Because she said, those cupcakes are for my Sunday school class. Don't eat those cupcakes. Now, I could change what she said if I didn't care about doing what she wanted. I could just take away one little word, and now that becomes, hey, Chris, eat those cupcakes. And I can be obedient to that command. But listen to this. When I have changed what she said, it was really because it just allows me to do what I already wanted to do. I have no intention on ever being obedient to what she's telling me to do if I change it. If I take away a word, I can make it say whatever I want it to say. But not if I care about doing what she wants. If I care about doing what the Lord wants, I can't take away parts of his word. Because to take it away is to change it, is to intentionally ignore it. Partial obedience is complete disobedience when it comes to the Word of God. Don't change it. 
Don't take anything away. Somehow we've gotten this idea that we can take away from the instructions of God and we're still convinced of our own obedience, but we're wrong. Amen. It says, don't add anything. I could take that same instruction from my wife, and if I added words to the statement, it might look like something like this. It might say, uh, don't eat those cupcakes until we get in the car. <laughs> so now I add something to it. And so listen, I, I'm not just following her instructions now. I'm, I'm doing one better. I've added one, right? Now I've waited until I got in the car. Okay, listen, so I'm still being disobedient. I am still intentionally breaking her instructions. I am still intentionally trying to find some way to manipulate what she said to allow it to do what I want to do. Now my obedience has everything to do with what I want and nothing to do with what she wants. Yeah. And when we add something to the Word of God or we take away something from the instructions of God, our obedience to it, even if there is any, is strictly about us doing what we wanted to do. It has nothing to do with being obedient to God anymore. Right. He says, if you want to be obedient, don't change anything. Because if you change something the Word of God says, you have now made it impossible to be obedient to it. There was a time in the book of Galatians where some men came and infiltrated the church of Galatia. And those men came to the church of Galatia, and they came to the Galatians, and they fooled them. They started adding things to salvation. They started telling them, hey, listen, if you want to be saved, you have to do this also. If you want to be saved, yes, you have to trust in Christ, but you also have to do this. If you want to be saved, you have to trust in Christ. Then, and then you, yes, you have to trust in Christ, but you also have to be circumcised. They, they added all these things. And Paul writes to them about it. Paul writes to them about this decision, and he says to them, hey, listen, you guys are foolish. He doesn't tell them, hey, good job. You, you took the commandments of the Lord, and you even went a mile further. That's not obedience. He said, okay, good, hey, good job. You guys trusted in Christ, but you guys did even more than that. You guys took, it, took, took the commandment, and you ran with it. You went even further. No, he doesn't tell them that. He tells them, O foolish Galatians, who hath bewitched you that ye should not obey the truth before whose eyes Jesus Christ hath been evidently set forth, crucified among you? He says, O foolish Galatians, you think you're being obedient right now? You're being disobedient. Who hath fooled you into thinking that what you are doing right now is obedience to God? You have changed what the Word of God says. You have Change it around to suit your own needs, your own ideas. And now you're calling yourself obedient. It's foolishness. Amen. It's foolishness. It's not real. Don't add paint to a masterpiece. You ruin it. Amen. Amen. Don't erase a masterpiece. You ruin it. In either case, you no longer have what the author intended. What you have is your own creation. Any addition or subtraction or other modifications, if there is any type of change, any alterization to replace it, now you have your own creation. Now you have your own design. It's not God's anymore. Now it's your design. It's your ideas now. It's your words now. It's your plan now. You didn't help it. You didn't help God's word. You didn't update it. You replaced it. It's not God's word, it's yours. And here's the problem with that. Here's the problem with it not being God's word anymore, and that is that your word is not quick and powerful. Amen. Your word is not quick and powerful. Your word is not a rock that breaks the hammer in pieces, breaks the, a hammer that breaks the rock in pieces. Your word is not sharper than any two-edged sword. Your word doesn't feed the soul. Your word was not there in the beginning with God, and all things were not created by your word. Amen. Faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. Your words cannot save. They don't need to be added to God's Word. They can't be added. All they can do is replace what God said. You change it, it changes everything. Verse 2 said, don't add anything or take away because that will prevent you from keeping them. Here's a few examples here. You know, those are some silly examples. Here's some good ones. The Bible says this in Romans 10, 13, Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord and the blessed Virgin Mary shall be saved. What was that what it says? No, that's not what it says at all. It says, for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. If I add in the blessed Virgin Mary, I have changed everything. Yeah. I have added to the word of God now. Well, isn't that good? Isn't that good? Now you're being obedient to God and you're being obedient to somebody else. No, I have ruined it. I have polluted it. I have changed the intention of the word of God. How about this one? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever should have everlasting life. Well, now I took some words away. That's not what it says. Now what I've said is that whosoever, now everybody's saved. Now everybody's going to heaven. I took some words away and I changed what it says. Or if I say, for God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him and in the blessed Virgin Mary should not perish but have everlasting life. That's not true either. If you add words or take away words, what you have done is you have changed God's word into your own creation. If it were a document on the computer, you couldn't save it with the same file name. You would have to create a new name for it. You know why? Because you can't call it 
the same thing because it's not. Because things that are different are not the same. Amen. If you change God's word, it is not God's word anymore. Now you've got to save it in your, under your own name and say, these are my words. You can either replace the existing file and get rid of it altogether, or you can save it under a new name because it's yours now. But you, what you cannot do is call it the word of God anymore because now it's yours. You have changed it. And you can't be obedient to God's word if it's your word. All you're doing is being obedient to yourself. If you want to outline for the first four chapters of Deuteronomy, it could go something like this. Number one, it says, remember. You're facing, you're facing both obstacles and opposition. So remember. The Lord has won these battles before, and you have lost them before. So remember. Remember how you have been sent to fleeing by this enemy in the past. So remember. Listen. Hearken to these things. Put yourself under the sound of the preaching of God's word. Learn. Be teachable. And come and be ready to be taught rather than to scrutinize. Four, apply. It says, for to do them. Be ye doers of the word and not hearers only, James 1.22 says. Come here and be ready to go do what you have been instructed to do. Amen. Lastly, and we'll close with this. These verses say, when you've done everything else, hang on. Verse 4 says, But ye that did cleave unto the Lord your God are alive, every one of you this day. Every single person through those trials that went and wrapped their arms around God and said, I'm going to hang on, every single one of them survived. Every single one of them that went and surrendered to the lusts of their flesh that went with Baal Peor, every single one of them that was overcome by temptation, that let go of God and grabbed onto something else, every single one of them was destroyed. But every single one of them that hung on to the Lord, every single one of them, it says, is alive to this day. Ye that did cleave unto the Lord your God are every alive, every one of you this day. You know what? There are enemies. Yes. And there are obstacles and there will be opposition. There are giants, there are walls, there are cowards, there are temptations of the flesh, and there are doubters telling you to turn back. There's a lot of moving around and there are uphill battles in front of you. You know, whenever the enemy occupies a mountain that you have been called to claim, every battle in front of you is going to be an uphill battle. There are uphill battles in front of you, and there will be changes in direction. There will be adversaries every direction. This is what you'll face on your way to the land of promise. But God can conquer all of them. Amen. God has conquered all of them. Amen. God has brought you to this point because he has conquered every other obstacle that you have faced Amen. to prevent you from being here. When you fear, cling to the Lord. When you hurt, cling to the Lord. When your flesh threatens to overwhelm you with temptations, cling to the Lord unto the Lord. Hang on for dear life. Hang on like your life depends on it. Amen. Because it does. Amen. I don't know what battle you're facing today. I don't know if you are facing a battle that you need to win. I don't know if you're recovering from a vicious loss. I don't know what giants are in front of you, but let me encourage you with what the Lord used to encourage me. From our position here on earth, those giants look tall and those walls look high. But even if they reach up to heaven, that just makes them an easier prey for our God. Amen. Here, Listen, learn, apply, and when you've done all else, hang on. Let's pray together. Every head back.